So it is my honor to welcome and introduce Dr. Stephen Ducato. Did I say it right? Right. <laughs> so, uh, I, I have to tell you how we received him here today. Uh, again, connections and resources. We're looking for a speaker. And Jess Barron, who's on our board of directors, she works for Carlon, Carlon Health. Carlon Health. And she said, I've got a guy for us. And she contacted Stephen, and here we are. So I'm really excited to hear his presentation. Thank you. Well, that's getting switched over. I'll do my, my intro and background. So I'm Keith Picotto. I'm an addiction medicine and internal medicine board certified doctor. My background uh, started in primary care. I worked in a federally qualified community mental health uh, community health center uh, in Massachusetts for uh, five years. And then I was a medical director for a uh, county jail in uh, Cape Cod, Massachusetts for seven years. Oh, there we go. Uh, and after that, I worked for Department of Mental Health for four years, learned a lot about serious mental illness, about addiction, how much it overlaps. And then after four years of uh, Department of Mental Health, I went back to corrections. I was a medical director for the Massachusetts Department of Corrections for uh, four years. And we did a lot with medical, mental health, uh, addiction treatment. And now, uh, my current role, I'm the SUD Medical Director for Carolyn, and we're partnered with WellSent, uh, managing about a third of the New Hampshire Medicaid patients. So, um, from my background, uh, my experience with people using marijuana is different from what uh, many coalition for youth is, is uh, working with, and I'm so honored to be part of this, because as many people have mentioned already, uh, prevention and talking about uh, drug use, marijuana use, alcohol, smoking, everything starts when kids are very, very young. And I'm um, honored to be here and be a part of it. Uh, so that was my intro, Carolyn Behavioral Health, Internal Medicine, Addiction Medicine. Uh, so what I'd like to go over, um, some history of cannabis that goes back about 5,000 years. Uh, some perceptions and misconceptions about marijuana use. Uh, some of the health concerns and what it means for marijuana to be medical. Um, I'm trying not to be editorializing during that part of it. And uh, some of the impacts on, uh, on legalizing and decriminalizing marijuana. Um, just spoiler alert, there's, there's been a lot of work done already on what happens to the case before and after marijuana is, is not only decriminalized but legalized. The impacts are pretty mild, but the, the, the way that they look at it is actually very, very uh, interesting. And then we'll have, have some discussion at the end. And by the way, if people want to interrupt and ask questions in the middle, please feel free. So this is the range going back about 5,000 years to China. Uh, part of their uh, traditional medicine uh, in, included uh, the cannabis plant among their, uh, their treatments and cures. And then the graphic on the right, fast forward to the United States around the 1930s, there was a big push to, to demonize the, uh, the existence and use of, of marijuana. So here's a little bit of a timeline. 2700 BC, uh, medically used in China, rheumatism and gout and malaria. Uh, pretty much stayed medical from what I could find until about 500 AD. It sort of drifted into the recreational use uh, space, uh, particularly in India, where they uh, learned to isolate the resins and oils to make hashish in some of the techniques that are still in use today. People are making um, waxes and, and hashish, even using some of those same ancient techniques, super concentrated, super powerful, and really dangerous, uh, particularly for young, for young people. Uh, the cannabis plant made it to the Americas in the 1500s, and it was actually a major crop uh, as hemp. It was used to uh, grow a fiber that was used to make textiles, clothing, rope, um, and other useful things. When cotton came uh, into this part of the world, that basically replaced uh, cannabis as a crop, and it just it just went away. Uh, it never, from what I could see in the history, it didn't come to the foreground as a, as a recreational drug uh, in the Americas at that time. Um, by the 1920s, when alcohol was outlawed in the United States, there was prohibition, uh, marijuana 
uh, build that blink, something you to do, and it was not one. Uh, because it was prevalent, because of the um, widespread use of, of marijuana as a uh, recreational drug, it also became medical, used in labor, for labor pains, nausea, and rheumatism. And by the 1930s, uh, the Bureau of Narcotics, which no longer exists, uh, identified uh, marijuana cannabis as a drug of concern, and it warned that it was uh, a gateway drug and would be straight to narcotics. And uh, narcotic addiction. In 1937, federal law prohibited its distribution and use. Uh, by 1970, the Gold Substance Act made marijuana a Schedule One drug, along with like peyote and heroin. It basically put it in the same category as those pretty uh, severe um, substances, labeling it as the highest potential for abuse and saying that there was no that there was no accepted medical use. So the pendulum had swung to that extreme. In the 1970s, as people were coming back from Vietnam, 10 to 15 percent of our U.S. servicemen were addicted to heroin, unfortunately. So with that, there was a rapid response to uh, criminalizing hard drugs, cocaine, uh, heroin, uh, and along with that, marijuana got swept up into that. It was all <coughs> all uh, criminalized. Marijuana to a uh, slightly lesser extent. In the earlier 70s, there was um, a push to um, roll back some of the mandatory minimum sentences that were created for marijuana. They identified the marijuana users as a little bit different from the people that were using cocaine and heroin. So there was a little bit of uh, forbearance given to those folks that didn't have to extend their mandatory minimum sentences anymore. And to Nixon's credit, he actually did direct some funding and some resources toward, toward treatment. Uh, in the 80s, as there was the, uh, the don't, the don't, the same no to drugs era, uh, there was a return to criminalization, particularly following uh, harsh rules for uh, cocaine uh, and, and crack cocaine. So now I think that swept up into some of that and then over time, it found its way back into the medical uh, arena. In the 1990s, saw creation of the first medicalization laws, particularly with people with HIV, wasting syndrome, uh, and cancer. There were uh, some arguments made to make it medical so that people could you know, gain some weight, and go pot and, and gain weight. And uh, going up to 2012, that's when the first states were able to pass laws uh, legalizing recreational use, uh, Colorado being one of them. So a few things, there are, there are many topics out there that I found really interesting about whether or not mar marijuana is medicine, uh, how marijuana affects adolescent development, um, is it a gateway drug or not, and uh, vaping, the whole deal with vaping. You know that vaping delivers very high uh, concentrations of marijuana and it's uh, gaining uh, rapidly uh, among uh, in prevalence among among junior high and high school kids. Uh, it's targeted, marketed towards kids, and it's kind of a thing that we all need to, as a as a community, get ahead of. So marijuana as medicine. I put together a slide just sort of contrasting how medical marijuana different differs from other actual medicines that are prescribed from doctors. The process for getting a marijuana medical card is pretty easy, pretty straightforward. You, you can go to Google and find doctors in your area that will give you a marijuana card. You go to them and just tell them what you have. I have migraines all the time. I'm perfectly fine right now, uh, but I have migraines. I like a marijuana card. And they'll, they'll take you $300 and give you the card. The doctor's name does not have that does not appear on the card. So when people present to a medical uh, dispensary, uh, the, the doctor is shielded from any exposure to uh, liability or just inappropriate uh, allowance of this of this uh, uh, privilege for for people. And then when you get to the dispensary. There's such a variety of what's there, like the, the concentration of THC and CBD in the marijuana products are not regulated, they're not known. 
fit to be contaminants, including pesticides, bugs, other stuff from the environment that's not really specifically identified and addressed. Uh, there is a great range in the uh, content of THC and the different products are available. And my last sort of contrast between medical and actual, medical marijuana and actual medicine is that you can't bring your marijuana card to a pharmacy and get anything, any medication, any, anything. So it's really, I would argue this is not, it's not really medical. And I'm not trying to judge or um, comment negatively on people that might use marijuana legally for a medical condition. It actually provides comfort in a number of conditions. So people that use it legally, that's great. Uh, there are some slides later on that show that can be problematic in a lot of folks that, that um, start by using it for medical reasons and it becomes its own problem. So regarding state laws, there are uh, 38 state laws where it's legal um, medically and 23 states plus DC where it's recreationally legal. An interesting thing is that as states bring forward um, a proposal to legalize marijuana, they present any combination of a number of medical conditions. There are about 100 different conditions that people say, whether it's pain or cyclic vomiting syndrome or nausea or rheumatism or, or whatever. And um, every state has its own sort of favorite medical condition that, that it applies for, and it's, it varies greatly. So it's a tremendous amount of inconsistency from state to state when these medical laws are put out there. The other interesting thing is that if, if a person who's 19 years old lives in a state where it's recreationally legal and also medically legal, they're not old enough to buy it in a dispensary for recreational use, but they can find a doctor, give them $300, tell them they have migraines or whatever condition that the state will honor as a medical condition and they'll get the card and it's, it's an end run. They can go into a medical place and just have access to it. And I would argue that further damage is caused because people get the notion that this is medical, that this is medicine, this is helping me. My doctor wants me to take this. That's what it gets turned into. Um, and it's, it couldn't be further from, from the truth. It's not FDA approved. It's a loophole for uh, 18 to 21 year olds. So I thought we could look at four of the medical conditions really quick that people um, say that they're using medical marijuana legally for. And for some people it does provide some comfort. It does actually help. But I think that what's important is what actually happens in, in a typical person with these conditions. So for insomnia, uh, the person that uses THC or whether it's medical marijuana or gummies or whatever they're using, they small amounts, infrequently, not every day, all day, throughout the day, um, the THC can actually help. But the typical person that's using it every day, all day, they're not gonna, their sleep is actually worse. It's not helping them, it's backfiring. Um, and as far as anxiety goes, same thing. If people use it in measured amounts, small amounts, infrequent amounts, it can actually be helpful. Um, however, there are so many better things out there. The real standard of care is CBT, not CBD, but CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's what's going to help people get through their marijuana. The medications help to some extent, but uh, a significant people that present, a lot of people don't present it to their doctors with anxiety. Right? It's an under-declared uh, condition that people have. And when people do go to the doctors with it, the medications out there are pretty good, they're not great. So in fairness, you know, add in THC to it, um, but use it sparingly. Here's the two last ones. So glaucoma is a condition where the pressure in people's eyes is too high based on a, a medical condition. Uh, there's medications out there to reduce pressure. The goal is to keep the pressure down so that blindness, blindness doesn't slowly develop in one or both eyes. Cannabis does decrease pressure in the eyes, but it only lasts about three or four hours. So in order to, for this to be effective, somebody would have to use cannabis every three to four hours to keep the pressure up. Uh, the American Academy of Ophthalmology has specifically disapproved of this as a, as a treatment for glaucoma because there are so many other medications out there and they did acknowledge that 
um, addiction and dependence is an unwanted, unintended, but all too common side effect that comes with using marijuana medically uh, in a drug fashion. Chronic pain, same thing. It's not a pain meds, but it does actually help, help some people with their painful conditions. But like a lot of other things, the, the use of it can chase the underlying condition, which isn't actually getting better from using marijuana, and it becomes its own problem in the form of dependence and addiction. Uh, but if people use it a little bit here and there, then, you know, that's fine. Yeah, legally, it, it can actually help. But the majority of people are not using marijuana uh, in that manner. How safe is it? Uh, this this one I wanted to put in there because I wanted to remind people that the marijuana plant, particularly the, the bud and the flower itself, contains both THC and CBD. They're very similar molecules. Um, over time, people have been selectively breeding marijuana plants to increase the concentration of THC, which is great if you're a breeder and if you're selling a product, but for people who are trying for the first time, particularly kids, it's actually pretty dangerous. Um, kids that are young and using uh, marijuana at high doses early on in their lives are far more likely to get uh, dependent and addict addicted to marijuana or THC products than somebody that's uh, randomly using it throughout later on in adulthood. Uh, the other interesting thing I learned is that the DEA, when they seize uh, cannabis that has been, you know, seized from people, they test it and they, they analyze how much THC, how much uh, CBD is present in it, and they track it. It's actually pretty interesting that we can see what's happening. So dependence is a real thing. And what I mean by that is about 10% of users, uh, re recreational users, uh, become dependent. And what that means is when they use it long enough, they, when they try to stop using it, they get all those symptoms, irritability, craving, disrupted sleep, uh, but then using uh, cannabis will alleviate those symptoms. Uh, the withdrawal from it is actually very serious. And it, it becomes its own problem. People believe, uh, start off believing that they're managing anxiety and depression with marijuana, and then when they don't have it, they run out, they're on vacation, they have you on an airplane, they couldn't bring it. Um, their anxiety and depression is much worse and compounded by this withdrawal syndrome that happens. Um, important factors I wanted to point out, younger people, uh, when people use marijuana younger, when they use it more frequently, when they use a more potent variety, strain of marijuana, they're far more likely than that 10% to become uh, dependent uh, and addicted. So these are a few ways in which uh, today's marijuana is more potent. As we said uh, on the last slide, the cannabis plant has been selectively bred over the past at least 20 years to select for higher concentrations of THC. So laws that were passed in Colorado in 2012, for instance, were passed based on the marijuana being a far less potent, um, the cannabis plant being a far less potent plant than it is right now. I, mean, I think they're learning that, they, they're realizing that in Colorado, but I think once you let the horse out of the barn, you can't get it back in. Uh, dabbing is basically, uh, what I mentioned earlier, is isolating a wax or resin from marijuana plants and flowers and uh, it, it boils, and they use these nasty chemicals, like butane and acetone to kind of get, to get the THC away from the flower, even the stems and the, and the, and the leaves to some extent. Uh, vaping, as was uh, mentioned earlier, there was a very high potency of THC, higher than people realize, and it's something that kids can, or people can slip into their pockets, uh, take it out, share with their friends, because they're doing something fun, and against the rules, and it's, it's actually very dangerous for this to be going on among, among our young, young, young kids. I wanted to say a few words about the link to mental illness, because there, there's a lot of information out there about cannabis or marijuana causing psychosis. It's, that's a, it's partially true, because there are some people that live just below a clinical, being, being able to be clinically diagnosed with schizophrenia or psychosis. 
And what marijuana can do is push them just over the edge. And if you ever meet somebody like that, it's really dramatic. Like, you would swear that they are a schizophrenic, psychotic person because they smoked some marijuana. And then when it wears off, they're back to not being psychotic anymore. Um, but it, for people that don't have that predisposition, it's not going to push people into becoming schizophrenic or psychotic. Um, same thing uh, with, I think I mentioned earlier, with, with anxiety and depression, it can help a little bit, but it, it begets its own problems when, you, when it's introduced as a treatment for anxiety and depression because of the withdrawal syndrome and, and the, the, the escalating uh, frequency and, and dose that people use. A few words about vaping. So the cloud of vapor of, that comes when people are they can see it. Uh, people, oh, that's that's like steam. It's some something that's burning off from a, a, a benign uh, delivery system. But it's actually, depending on what you're buying, it could be some nasty chemical, acetone, uh, probably glycol, ethyl benzene. These are like you know embalming fluids and. Um, Antifreeze, think of those kinds of chemicals. That's, that's what people are putting into their bodies, but also exposing people are fundamental too. And I don't know that, that people are aware of that, particularly kids. Uh, another alarming trend is that kids younger and younger are being exposed to it, admitting that they've tried it, that they've used it, and being offered it. People that don't have any intention of using it are offered it casually, frequently. And that's one thing that uh, when we get to later, it's something that parents and kids need to align themselves. You know, what are you going to do when that happens? How are you going to manage that situation? Um, and I thought there was another slide that, that Celeste showed that the usage on teens really has dramatically increased. 2018 to 2019, you had pressure data that is echoing that trend. Um, on the right, there are some links to um, some handouts that we can make available to people about, about um, the concerns around vaping. So the gateway drug question, I thought this was important to talk about what, what a gateway drug, what it means to be a gateway drug is that when a person starts using drug A, that they will be on a path to inevitably use harder drugs, B and C, heroin, cocaine. Um, National Institute of Drug Addiction uh, put out a statement in 2020 saying it's not quite true. All marijuana use does not lead to heavier drug use. Um, it's hard to not see that because when you look at people that are using cocaine and heroin and fentanyl and all these harder drugs, just about all of them are also using marijuana. But we, we forget that there's so many other people out there that started with marijuana, let it go, quit, put it down, or they use only that, and it didn't lead to harder drugs. So um, among, I think they among, among, among kids, they haven't really done studies with that. There, there's no ethical way to study that kind of also. So regardless of, of whether or not when you start using marijuana that leads to other harder drugs, marijuana itself has its own list of problems, of really serious problems, addiction and dependence. It's a big deal. Effects on a growing brain. Um, there are, there's a lot out there saying that when kids start young, 14, 15, 16 years old, and using it regularly, there could be permanent uh, impacts on their emotional maturation, on their, on their development, perhaps even loss of six to eight IQ points. That's forever, that's long lasting. Um, and that's the one where there's not been any, that you can't do a study for that, because if you can, they hate you smoking and you don't. But um, there's, there's been some, reporting about that, some controversy about it also. Um, as we said, some panic, anxiety, parents. Some people, when they smoke pot, they get panic, they get paranoia. And a lot of those people, they're like, I'm never doing that again, and they walk away from it. Some people find a way around to kind of beat it and still incorporate it into their day-to-day -day life. A motivational syndrome is a real thing that people get into this pattern where they sit on the couch, they smoke pot all day, they might play video games, they might even not have the energy to do that. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a real thing. Um, workers' comp claims, chronic underperformance. Some people believe that they perform better at work when they're vaping or smoking pot, but I highly doubt it. 
uh, marijuana toxicity. It's hard to overdose and die from it unless you're using other drugs with it, but there is a definite toxicity that people have to go to the emergency room and be medically managed for. These, this next set of slides I wanted to include because a lot of work has been done already looking at uh, dates uh, before and after recreational marijuana has been uh, enacted or been legalized in those states. Um, so if people are working on policies, this might be a good reference to look at because a lot of those work has already been done. Um, and I'll show you a, a few slides right there. Uh, this same study points out that advocates argue that legalization will reduce crime, will raise tax revenue, will improve public health, and increase traffic safety and stimulate the economy with, with the uh, tax revenue. Critics will argue that it will spur uh, worse uh, marijuana usage, uh, spread to stronger drugs and alcohol, increasing crime, uh, diminishing traffic safety, in public health. And what the uh, Cato Institute believes is that on both sides of, of people advocating, uh, the truth gets stretched a little bit. Uh, sometimes some falsehoods get incorporated into the arguments being made. They did not say which were true, which were false, but they basically said people worked really hard to make their case. And uh, there, there's sometimes some not so true things being incorporated into it. They did say that tax revenue does go up. However, what we're hearing is that people on the ground are spending more money managing um, the other stuff that happens from having more marijuana in the communities, the police costs, the arrest costs, the drug courts. The, so there may, there's a significant offset in the amount of revenue that comes in. So uh, here's a few examples of some of the graphs that they put in their publication. This is the Cato Institute publication. The line in the middle represents the year that a state legalized recreational marijuana. And each of those lines is a different state where um, how have things been trending before legalization happened, then what happened after legalization happened. Did, was there an uptick, was there a downtick? Did it stay the same? And what's interesting about this graph is nearly all those states had a trend upwards of marijuana use anyway before it happened. And then when marijuana was legalized, it just basically continued along the same trajectory. Um, the line all the way down the bottom is Colorado, I believe. And that uh, that is an interesting one, because that's basically where it was legal nowhere, and then it was legalized. And then look how sharp the uptake was. So overall, they're, they're saying that it didn't really change the usage in the state, though, uh, in other states overall. Uh, tax revenue, this is month over month. When marijuana is legalized uh, for recreational use, it takes about two years for policies and procedures and licensing for facilities to go into place. So there's a lag of two years. And then they start uh, realizing some tax revenue. And as you can see, take, uh, states are definitely showing some increase in their tax revenue. Uh, these next ones, uh, I wanted just to acknowledge that the work has been done. What happened to employment? What happened to unemployment? There's not a whole lot of difference. The, the lighter line, the gray line, is all of the United States, whether it's legal or not. That's what, what the numbers show. And the darker line is either the state that they're looking at or on the bottom right is all states where it's been legalized uh, compared to the Green Line where it's just the, the base on the United States. And there doesn't appear to be a big impact on employment. There might be a little bit of an uptake, uptick in alcohol consumption. Cocaine maybe. When you look at the bottom right hand side, those two curves diverge a little bit where the darker line, which is where states have legalized it, appears to take up a little bit compared to baseline with cocaine usage. Violent crime, the same thing. It's, it's basically level across the board. Alaska had an uptick. And then I want to give a shout out to Maine and Vermont for just having baseline very low rates of violent crime before anything happens. So kudos to Vermont and, and Maine. OK, uh, last couple slides. 
So I found two places online where it gives people advice on how to talk to, to child parents who talk to kids. It's a very important part of this. Um, and these links can be, can be shared also. The first one is from SAMHSA, and they basically advocate there's really no age that's too young for parents to start talking to their kids and, and actually, you know, with your child, not to your child. And they, they tell you how to engage, how to to bring it up casually, how to ask, you know, what are you what are you hearing from your friends about cigarettes, what about alcohol, what about vaping? And it can basically normalize uh, the conversation and also show that your parents care about you. Like we said earlier that when, when nobody asks you what you're what you're doing or tells you that something's harmful, you know, they don't feel as loved or they don't know that people care about them. This is a nice way for parents to show that they that they care. This this one also gives uh, an example of if, if someone's going to a party where they know they're going to be offered a vape, they can tell their friend, oh, my mom drug tests me every time I go out, even if they don't, just to, just to have cover. Because sometimes kids need help. Kids need so like, why do you say no? Because saying no is not always easy among your friends. So this is the second one, uh, Partnership to End Addiction. It's longer, it's about 20 pages, but it's really readable some really helpful um, ways to, for parents to talk to kids about, um, you know, how to engage, what words to avoid, what words to use instead, uh, how to to talk to them, even if you use marijuana yourself, uh, which can be a little touchy in some families, but um, very important. So just to wrap up, uh, marijuana's been around for thousands of years. Um, more widely available as it's becoming more legally available across the state, but at the same time becoming more potent and thereby therefore more harmful. Uh, the addictive potential in kids is really underappreciated due to those factors of them being young and being exposed to it at higher doses uh, and perhaps more frequently they're much more likely to become addicted than, than people who started later on in life. Uh, in fact, the developing brain is significant, potentially permanent, uh, legalization at the state level has been studied, definitely needs more study, but there are some good data out there uh, that people have been working on policy can uh, consider when they're uh, trying to make their own policies. And then uh, lastly, educational efforts for kids and especially parents is really important. No age is too young to start um, and I just want to make sure that we know that when we get parents involved and teachers involved in this, this coalition has been doing it, has been doing it really makes a difference. That's it. Any questions?
kind of critique of the mental health and emotional challenges such as growing and young people. Just a, a one, maybe two part question. I was sort of interested when we look at, you know, clearly there are addictive you know, aspects to, to marijuana that, you know, kind of newly recognized. I thought it was interesting that you mentioned only 10% really develop what we consider a dependency um, as compared to, for example, you know, opiates where the dependency level is, is really much higher. So I just wonder whether you have any thoughts, number one, on that. And another thing that wasn't mentioned that I've more recently read about is the infiltration of fentanyl into some cannabis, cannabis supplies, which is probably for young people, if you're listening, um, in terms of life and death issues, um, regardless of the potency and the vaping and all the other toxicities in there, fentanyl finding its way into the marijuana supply with young people not even thinking that they might be getting exposed out of fentanyl. Um, That's a great what, point. A great what's about that risk? Uh, that, that I've seen moved. When we had uh, outpatient addiction clinics um, with well after we would get people to be um, clean on Suboxone and occasional marijuana here and there, and then people come in with a positive for fentanyl. And we're like, oh, did you have a, what happened this week? Like, oh, everything was great. Nothing happened. It just smoked pot a couple days ago, and we decided that if we use it in measured amounts, I don't have to give it up entirely just yet. And when sales, there was there was actually fentanyl in that, and they would uh, be very surprised. And not that they were trying to hide something, but you could tell who the people were that were in great condition uh, and not likely to be going back to using fentanyl or opiates, that they were genuinely surprised. It is definitely out there. I'm curious to see what's going to happen with xylazine also, if that's going to find its way into this marijuana. People believe they're buying marijuana, but they're buying you know, other things that are mixed in with it. Uh, low birth weights and overall just poorer health, earlier deliveries. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nicola, for all the information, and thank you for our participants in the audience as well. I don't know if we ever had a Q&A in the middle of one of these before. That was pretty cool.